Good morning, church. My man over here gets it. Good morning, church. That's what I'm talking about. It is so good to see all of you this morning. Let's stand as we prepare to sing, as we prepare to hear the word preached, pray with one another, and enjoy fellowship. Father, we love you. We thank you for this beautiful day you've given us to gather together in the name of Jesus, um, to sing songs of praise, to celebrate all that you have done for us, to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ um, with one another, uh, and not just to celebrate, but to pray with one another, to encourage each other by your word, to hear the preaching of your word publicly. We thank you for that opportunity. We ask now that you would bless our time. Holy Spirit, stir our hearts, our minds, and our affections for Jesus, for your gospel, your good news, um, and be glorified in our singing, our praying, and our preaching this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let us sing and celebrate this good news. Come thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain, fix upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song, now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. Come now, found, come now, King, come now, precious Prince of Peace. To you we sing, come now, fount of our blessing. Come now, fount, come now, King. Come now, precious Prince of Peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come now, fount of our blessing. Oh, to grace. How great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Come now, found, come now, King, come now, precious Prince of Peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. be seated. Can I get the kids up here? 
Good morning, guys. It's good to see you. You can sit on the carpet if you want to. I promise I won't bite. Good morning, guys. It's good to see everybody. Have y'all had a good week? Yeah, pretty good. So we've got a new lesson this week, but we're kind of building off of last week. Do you remember what we talked about last week? Do you remember what came down out of the sky last week? Yes, sir. That's right. We had fire come down on the believers. And what else? There's one other thing. Yes, ma'am. That's right. The animals came down. Remember, God showed Peter a vision of all the animals coming down. And remember, before Jesus died, Jews couldn't eat everything, right? There were certain things they could only eat. And Jesus brought down um, the sheet of animals, and he said, take, kill it, and eat it, because now everything was clean. And he did that to show us that just like Jews and Gentiles, people who weren't Jews could both be saved kind of like the animals. The animals were all clean, and now all people can be clean too. So this week, we're talking about how just like the church grew then, they grew later. They kept growing. So, guys, this is my very first week doing this, so you're going to have to bear with me. I completely lost my train of thought. We're in Acts 11. Okay, have you ever had like a really, really rough week? Have you had like a really bad day before? What helps you feel better when you have a bad day? Oh, chocolate helps. <laughs> chocolate can be very helpful. What about you, Lizzie? Art. Art. What else helps you guys? Painting. Painting. Writing down all my bad thoughts. Ooh, writing down the bad thoughts. Sleeping sometimes helps, too, because we get to rest. Do you ever go to mom or dad or an older sibling and say, oh, my goodness, this just doesn't feel good. I'm struggling with this. Can you help me? And they encourage you and help talk you through it. So the church was going through a lot of really hard things, right? Remember how before Saul became Paul, was he being nice to Christians? No, he was having a rough time. They were... Um, and he was persecuting the Christians. That's what we call it. But then, who did he meet on the road? Who did he meet? Who did Saul meet on the road, and then he became a Christian? Who, Lizzie? Jesus. Jesus, and then he became Paul. But Saul wasn't the only person persecuting Christians. Lots of other people were doing it. The church was going through a really, really hard time. So what do you think they had to do? They had to en encourage. encourage each other. So today when we go upstairs, we're going to learn about a man named Barnabas. Have you heard of Barnabas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We might have talked about him a little bit last week. We're going to talk about him a lot more this week. Because Barnabas traveled all the way from Jerusalem, all the way to Antioch, so that he could encourage the other Christians and so that they could grow together. Sound good? Yeah. Sound good? Yes. Okay. So real quick, we're going to do our memory verse. And after we do our memory verse, we'll go upstairs, we'll play games, we'll watch our video, and we've got a fun activity to do. So do you want to stand up so that we can do our memory verse? And this Abby clearly has stage fright, so you guys are going to have to help me out because I don't know. I haven't been up here before, so I'm struggling. Are you going to help me? Okay, so what is our memory verse? Five, Romans 5, 8. And it says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. From nice, guys. Thank you. So we can go back to our parents and our families, and after we greet and have a good time visiting other people, we'll head upstairs.
Thank you. Excellent job, Abby. <laughs> this is Abby's first time doing it. So, uh, good job, Abby. Hey, that's my son. Uh, of course, he's the loudest one here. So, parents, you don't have anything to worry about because my son will overpower them. All right, so I'm glad that y'all are here. I'm glad that you're here in person. I'm glad that if you're watching, I'm glad that you're able to watch. Uh, again, I'm always thankful for our tech crew that uh, we can make this happen every morning or every Sunday morning. A uh, few things, if this is your first time either here or if this is your first time watching us, uh, we would love for you to text the word CONNECTION to 97 thousand, and that just, you can put as much information as you want in there. Uh, this is so that we know who you are, and we have your phone number and your email address, and we just want to get to know you. Uh, so, uh, so I'll probably give you a call or an email or something like that, and I'll try to get together with you as uh, quickly as I can, as, as our schedules will allow. And, um, and so I, sometimes I play phone tag pe with people for like weeks or, uh, or just, you know, plans and things get canceled, but it happens eventually. Uh, another thing is giving. Uh, if you want to give, we see giving as an act of worship. We also see it between you and God. Uh, so we don't seek this gift for ourselves. We seek it for your own spiritual blessing. And so that's something that I want you to, uh, to decide on for yourself and for your family. Uh, but those avenues of giving are, there's a little black basket back there on the uh, camera stage back there. Uh, there's also a way you can do it digitally. You can go online, backpagechurch.com, and you can give in that way if you so choose. Uh, last, next thing is, not last thing, I got many more things, all right? Next thing is that Back Bay students, y'all are going to be meeting here Tuesday at 6.05. People ask, why do y'all meet at 6.05? It's because this is a child care facility, and they close at 6. And so we show up after them. Uh, we're not real fancy on things. Anyway, uh, the other thing, we've got small groups. Man, we're like growing small groups, like, weekly. It's awesome. And we have more and more happening. Um, Joshua leads a small group. Uh, Megan, uh, on Saturday nights, Megan leads a small group on Thursday mornings at 9 uh, for women. And uh, Malachi, he, his small group is starting this week, this Wednesday. If you have a family, if you're a couple and you've got kids and you're like, man, don't, can't find childcare. Man, they got a huge house. All right, so uh, kids run around everywhere. So if, if you want to uh, join Malachi for his small group, uh, I invite you to do that. Contact him. He's actually in the tech booth right now, or you can contact me, and we'll make sure that you get his address, his phone number, and so, and they're going to be going through the book of First John, correct? Yeah, that's correct. All right, so, uh, so if you're interested in that small group, let him know. Uh, and also, yeah, so we've got a prayer group starting. Uh, we, have, we have two women in our church that just love to pray, uh, Egenea and Pamela, and they are getting that going. And, uh, and so if you want to pray, we've got a group for that. Uh, Y'all, every week there's someone else saying that they want to host and they want to lead a uh, small group and they want to teach the Bible. So, so it's an exciting time. So y'all come to me. We're going to try to get that information out there and, uh, so that you can be a part of that. Uh, next thing coming up. Man, so we don't have a, I don't know if we have a graph for this yet, but we want to go ahead and let you know. Uh, we're excited that things seem to maybe seeing some normalcy on the horizon. And, uh, and so, so we're excited to say that on Palm Sunday, right after the service, uh, we're going to just hang out as a church, and we're going to do an Easter egg hunt out here. We're going to have, I think, some inflatable things uh, out on the other side, and we're going to have lunch, and we're going to spend some time together. So on that day, uh, make your lunch plans with us on Palm Sunday. Uh, we're going to get together after the worship service, and we're just going to hang out together. Sound good? Feel free to bring somebody that day. Feel free to bring some people with some family and some kids or some singles or whatever. Just bring some people so we can hang out together. And guess what? I think we're also having some chairs being added. We're getting some more chairs, and uh, it's just, these are all very cool things. All right, so next thing. Oh, I also want to just call your attention again to decals and invite cards. So uh, I, I pull these out all the time. But out there on the foyer, there are some decals that you can put on the back of your car. Uh, remember, you have to drive safe and, and uh, nicely if you 
have a decal of our church on the back of your car, uh, and also, but also don't use that as an excuse not to put the decal on the back of your car, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so, um, also, you have these invite cards. You can put these in your purse, in your wallet, and, uh, and they open up, and they show people exactly where they are, so they're very simple. So, just hand these out like, well, invite cards. And um, the people who stole my bag last week, they have a bunch of these now. <laughs> so... I'm praying that they come this morning with my bag and my laptop. So, uh, but I know, right? And so, uh, anyway, uh, now I think that's all I have. Have I forgotten anything? Okay, good. Uh, so, I'm going to give you all a few minutes. Y'all say hi to each other. Meet some people you haven't seen yet. Uh, make some lunch plans. Get some numbers. Make some coffee plans. Get to know each other. Let's be a family. Let's take a few minutes and then we're going to sing again.
All right, church, let's stand as we continue to sing. You are the Lord, the famous one, famous one. Great is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your glory. your fame beyond the earth and for all you've done and yet to do with every Praising you, desire of nations and every heart, you alone are God, you alone are God, you are the Lord, the famous one, famous one, great is your name. Your glorious, glorious, great is your fame beyond the earth. The morning star is shining through. And every eye is watching you, revealed by nature and miracles, you are beautiful, you are
and there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins Church of God, be safe to sin no more. Be safe to sin no more. Be safe to sin no more. Till all the ransom church of God. Church, his name above all names. Name above all names, worthy of all praise, and my heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how 
Hound Crane, Hound Crane is our God. You're the name above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing. above all names you're the name above all names you are worthy of all praise and my heart will sing how great is our God my song my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art. How great Thou art. How great Thou art. How great thou art. Father, you are great. We thank you for the price that was paid on the cross for us. The sin debt that we can never hope to repay, you paid on that cross. So we thank you for salvation. We thank you that we can gather together this morning as a saved people, a redeemed people who have been bought by the blood of Jesus. And even beyond that, knowing that we don't serve a dead God because Christ did not stay dead, but he rose again. And we know because of your word that he is coming again. And so we thank you for this hope, this promise that we can trust this morning. I ask now that, Holy Spirit, you would give Adam boldness to preach your word. Let him preach it with clarity, with passion and compassion. And may us as your children, your sons and daughters this morning, hear your word, receive your word, and be made more like Jesus through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I was following uh, one of the Facebook groups that I follow. This Clearly, it was a married couple having a little bit of a conflict. And uh, like all healthy relationships do, they go to Facebook to weigh in. And so she, she decides to post this question uh, to this group, and she posts the question, uh, how do you butter your toast? And she said, do you butter it, uh, do you toast it and then butter it like a normal person, or do you toast it and then you, do you butter it, then toast it like a psychopath? <laughs> you can obviously tell that she was somewhat biased in the way she phrased the question. 
<laughs> but conflicts happen. <laughs> Sometimes we go to Facebook to resolve them. Uh, and, you know, conflicts happen. I mean, my marriage has conflicts. I, you know, we're a normal couple. And so your marriage probably has conflicts. Even roommates have conflicts, especially when you start to live with one another and you realize that you have different habits. Uh, one of the cliche conflicts among married couples is uh, toilet seat up or down, right? And so, you know, guys, you know, we don't mind keeping that up until in the middle of the night you go to the bathroom and you leave that toilet seat up and you take a bottom half bath in toilet water, which isn't fun. And so now you realize, you go, oh, that's why she wants to keep that toilet seat down. The other thing that I have in my marriage is the toothpaste top, okay? It's either open or closed. The correct position is closed, all right? So uh, you can imagine the conflict now. So I have resolved this conflict by always buying two tubes of toothpaste, <laughs> hers and his. Uh, the other, there are other things like thermostat. You know, you fight over the thermostat. If you're, if you're newly married or if you're going to get married one day or if you haven't figured this out yet, I would go ahead and come up with maybe a contract or an agreement on, uh, on where the thermostat is going to be. If it's this temperature outside at this humidity level, we're going to have it at these range and have that prearranged so that there's no conflict or argument and you can always go back to that. So, that's an understandable thing. And there are other things that happen that I hear that happens. It happens to me sometimes. It's like sometimes what you want to do or what you want to eat are in conflict. So football game versus art festival. Y'all, you might be loving some art festivals or some farmer's markets or something like that. But y'all, Please don't plan it during the Packers game, okay? So, I mean, that's just not, that's not cool. All right, so the other thing is maybe where do you, what do you want to eat, you know? Maybe you want to have a steak and potatoes, but she, I'm going to blame it on she, okay? But she, maybe it's he, wants a charcuterie board. Y'all, I didn't even know how to spell charcuterie. I have it in my notes. I had to ask Google to spell charcuterie for me. Y'all, if you don't know what a charcuterie board is, it's a slab of wood with cold meat, olives, and cheese on it, typically, and maybe some fruit. Y'all, okay, that's just not dinner. That's just, that's like an hors d'oeuvre, okay? So, but people order it for dinner. Uh, shopping, you know, she wants you to go shopping with her. Again, I'm blaming it on her again. Maybe, guys, you want to go shopping, and she just wants to hang out or something. But there's two ways that people shop, right? There's the way my wife shops. Man, we're going to have all kinds of communication opportunities after this, after this <laughs> sermon. All right, so it's the way my wife shops, which is going from store to store, looking at everything, and then walking out with nothing. Okay. Now, I, that's not me saying I want her to spend more money, all right? But that's just saying, like, I don't understand that because the way I shop, I don't really shop. I buy. I decide what I want. I go in. I get it. I leave, okay? But then there's a whole new way of shopping, and she wants you to experience that with her. Because why? Because she loves you. And so I have to go and experience it. Y'all, I could not imagine the days where you didn't have a phone that you could sit on a bench and watch and read something. She said that her grandfather used to bring a book while they would go shopping. He would sit and read the book. Y'all, I'm, I'm glad for cell phones today. All right, so uh, the other thing I just wanted to bring up is the whole doctor thing, okay? I understand some guys, I'm kind of one of these guys, you don't really want to go to the doctor, you know? I mean, she's looking at you and she's like, you're bleeding kind of bad. No, nah, I'm good, walk it off. And so you're, <laughs> it's fine. And some people want to go to the doctor and some people don't. I probably don't, I mean, maybe I'm just like a typical guy. My mom's also a nurse. And so like, honestly, it had to be a lot of blood to be able to, to take you to the doctor. It had to be major injuries, right? And so, like, bones sticking out and stuff. All right, she's like, she's on the front row right now, so I'm picking on her. Okay, so, <laughs> I didn't even have that in my notes, Mom. All right, so I'm just, you know, I'm just shooting from the hip. All right, so now my wife and my mom are going to have a communication opportunity with me after the sermon. That's what I call conflicts, <laughs> communication opportunities. We all have conflicts. Conflicts happen. 
I'm joking a little bit this morning, but you know, it's sometimes the smallest little things. We talked a few weeks ago about the little foxes. That they can come in and they can really drum up a lot of hurt, a lot of failed expectations, and, and we bring those in, and sometimes it can cause conflict. I think what we see in the passage today between darling and beloved, that's our couple here in the Song of Solomon. And what I see in this is that they are going to have some, a little bit of conflict. Now, it's all within a dream, but sometimes if we're having a conflict in our real lives, it kind of comes into our dream. I've had those dreams. You wake up and you're angry at the person, right? And so she has this, I think, this dream. And it's interesting how this conflict is resolved. But let's look at it. We're looking at Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2, all the way through, through chapter 6, verse 3. And today we're calling this Reuniting Intimacy. Let's read it. I want to read basically uh, the first section that we're going to cover here today. And we're going to just cover, I want to cover just chapter 5, verses 2 through 8. And then we'll talk a little bit, and then we'll bring it up. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved, was knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is drenched with dew, my locks with damp of the night. I have taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? My beloved extended his hand through the opening, and my feelings were aroused for him. I rose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the hands and the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and had gone. My heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guardsmen of the walls took away my shawl from me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved as to what you will tell him, for I am lovesick. So this, and the reason I believe that this begins with a dream is this first little line. She says, I was asleep, but my heart was awake. So it clues us in that there's some sort of uh, maybe sleep state. Now, maybe she was just half asleep or something that some people argue. I would actually argue with the with the way this goes and with what we've seen, we've already seen a dream before, and it seems a very strange event that she's out on the street. This is the, the queen of you know, Jerusalem, and so like queen of Israel, and so she's out there, and, and she's out on the street, and they treat her badly. Like, it just seems strange to be an actual event. So that's why I take this as a dream. But in this dream, She's dreaming, and she dreams about her husband, and he's outside of the door. We see that, and she hears him knocking. She said, and he's saying, open to me. Open up, my beloved. And so she says, open to me, my sister. And he uses that word sister to kind of this idea of permanent love. And he says, he calls her, he uses all kinds of words of affirmation, darling, dove, perfect one. That's what, he, that's what a husband does, right? When he's, when he's trying to gain access to his wife and she's not having it. Sweetie, <laughs> most beautiful one. <laughs> and that's what he's, I think that's what he's doing here. And the reason I say that is because now she, she responds. And y'all, her response, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's funny. Okay, I have taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I dirty them again? She's basically saying, I've already gotten ready for bed. If you wanted to see me, you probably should have shown up earlier. (laughs) Okay, I mean, that's that's essentially what she's saying. You know, she's like, I've already put on my nightgown. I've already washed my feet. I'm warm in the bed. Your little knocks and words of affirmation are not going to get me up. (laughs) So that's what happens. So we don't know why she's inside. Now, we could say, I believe that there's a little bit of conflict happening here between these two. It could also just be an outside situation. But obviously, she doesn't want to bother herself to get up and open the door for whatever reason. We don't know why. Like I said, I think this is just a dream, and it's showing maybe what's happening in, in, this, in this relationship, in this married couple's life. So she 
doesn't want to see him. But then, look what she said, what happens. My beloved extended his hand through the opening. Now, it's kind of hard to understand what's happening there. Probably uh, in their day, uh, there were doors, and they didn't really have peepholes, but what they had is like basically a gap in the door, kind of in the middle of the door, so you could see who was coming through the door. And so it seems like that he is extending his hand through that. Y'all, this guy is pitiful, okay? I mean, look at it. I mean, like, look at look. He says, He says, for my head is drenched. Now, he's using all these words of affirmation, and he says, for my head is drenched with dew, my locks in the damp of the night. He's been outside all day in that arid temperature, in the, in the heat, the water and the dew and everything would gather up in the air when the cool of the, uh, the air would come, all of a sudden all that would drop to the ground. If you were outside, then you would actually get wet in that region. And so now he's coming to the door and he's, honey, I'm all wet. <laughs> I've been outside. And then he's like, open up. And she's like, nah. And, uh, and then he starts, then he sticks his hand and he's like, hey. <laughs> I, that's the, that's the, that, I think that's what's going on here. And he's pitiful, all right? Poor guy. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, extending myself to this at all. All right, so poor guy, he's just wanting to see his wife. And I don't know what he has done, but she doesn't want to open the door. And so he's extending his hand. But look what happens. My beloved extended his hand through the opening. Man, and my feelings were aroused for him. Oh, her heart softens. And all of a sudden now her heart is aroused. And she's like, oh, okay, I'll get up. I love this lovable idiot. All right, so, he's, so she gets up and she goes to the door. And she says in verse 5, I rose to open to my beloved. So now she's rising up. It doesn't even say she put on a robe. Maybe she did. I think she did. But she goes and she says, my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid myrrh. Remember, myrrh in this context is, uh, is acquainted with uh, sexual intimacy. And so now she's, when she touches the door handle of the bolt, she's really excited to see him. Like, just, just the, the contact with what he was touching and trying, to, and trying to open the door, she touches that knowing that on the other side, when she opens up that door, her beloved will be standing there, and that just makes her aroused, and it makes her excited to see him. And so she opens the door. She opened the door to her beloved in verse 6, but my beloved had turned away and gone. Man. Like, she's so excited to see him, and she waited a little bit, and now he's gone. Now, if you, if you spare me just a little bit of speculation as to why he left, possibly it's just, you know, that happens sometimes, right? That it takes us a little while to forgive. It takes us a little while to, to get over what, whatever it was, but then we do. The other person now is, like, is done. Or now that other person is angry. Possibly that's what's going on here in this dream. That now he has, he has extended her, himself to her and he's pursued trying to see her, but she was not having it. And then now when she's ready to see him, he's now turned away. I can see it happening. This is, I love the Song of Solomon. I was talking to Travis about this earlier before the service. And we were talking about how just how real and how raw Solomon Solomon can be. And I can feel this conflict happening. And so she arrives and she goes to it, but he's gone. And then she says, my heart went out to him as he spoke. I searched for him, but I did not find him. I called him, but he did not answer me. You see this, this anxious dream that she's having, having now. She opens the door and surprise, he's gone. And now she begins to search for him, but she can't find him at all. She's no, he's nowhere to be seen. She calls out for him. So all of a sudden in this dream, she ends up on the street, middle of the night. Also kind of just a strange thing if this was actually happening. So she's out on the street, and the watchmen around the city, they, they found her, and they strike her, they beat her, and they wounded her, and they take her shawl from her. Again, kind of a strange thing. 
And she's out here, and what seems to be happening is they've mistaken her for a prostitute. I might be making a little bit of a leap here, but in Proverbs 7, 9 through 10, also written by Solomon, he writes, In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness, and behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. In their day, typically, you wouldn't be a woman going around in the streets at night in your nightgown unless you are a prostitute. So I don't think it's a real big stretch to say that the guardsmen, the watchmen, thought that she was a prostitute, and they beat her. Now, of course, again, this is a dream. So what is this about? Why, why is she doing this? And, and I guess maybe we don't want to, I don't want to step too far into the realm of dream you know, interpretation here, but this is a difficult thing because I'm interpreting Scripture and at the same time interpreting a dream within the Scripture, and it's also Hebrew poetry. So man, the levels of complication just escalate uh, with everything. I told someone else earlier today that I would rather uh, interpret and teach the book of Revelation than the Song of Solomon uh, because, man, it is difficult. But, so I think, again, why is she doing this? Well, I was speculating, and, and some thoughts that I, might, I had was possibly she's feeling guilty for not opening the door, and so she feels like she's experienced some sort of harm in their relationship. Maybe that's why she's dreaming this. The other option could be this, and this is the one maybe I'm leaning towards, is that she's feeling a loss and danger in that they are separated. This is the second time in the song, the book of Song of Solomon that there's separation between them. Okay, the first time, remember, he, he came in like a majestic gazelle leaping on the hills, if you remember this. And he comes in, and he is this majestic creature, and he stops just short of the door, and he's gazing at her, and she sees him, but they can't get to each other. And there's this separation caused by external circumstances, And they're longing to be together and wanting to have that affection with one another, but they can't because there's something separating them. So that was earlier in the book of Song of Solomon. Now we see this separation in a different way. It's not necessarily an external thing that's happening, but it seems to be an internal consequence that's causing separation. And in that separation, she's feeling anxiety and loss and danger. And that danger then is, is in this, is this, is, I guess, represented by these watchmen who are causing her harm. Her beloved isn't there. He is her security, as she has said many times. And her security is not there anymore. And she feels like she's in danger. That's my thought. And then what she does is she goes to the daughters of Jerusalem. It's a dream. All of a sudden, they're there on the streets, right? And so the daughters of Jerusalem, this chorus, just pop in, and she says, she says, I adjure you, I beg of you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved as to what you will tell him, for I am lovesick. So she says, if you can find my beloved, tell him, I'm lovesick, I'm in love, I want to see him. We're separated. And so she wants to find this man desperately. I think if you're going to take anything away from this one little section is that that's what it is. They have this separation between them. And she, even though that was there, she says, you know what, forget about that. I just want to be with him. And so she does. And so she searches for him. Y'all, conflict and trouble will occur in marriage. It will. I mean, if you're married, you already know that. If you're not married, I promise you, there will be conflict. But it's true about any relationship. There's going to be conflict in any relationship that you have with your kids, coworkers, friends, whoever. If you have any kind of relationship that continues, there's going to be conflict. I don't want to get into like this big thing of how to resolve conflict. I want to take what maybe the text has given us. You know, one thing I saw between these two is persistent pursuing of one another. You notice he knocked on the door and then he extended his hand. He didn't knock on the door. She said, no, I'm I'm good. And he goes, fine, I'm done with you. No, he knocks on the door. She says, no, I'm not getting up. And he continues to pursue her. Now he does end up taking off. But then what does she do? She then says, you know what? No, I'm going to pursue him back. 
I'm going to go back after him. I'm going to be persistent in my pursuit for reconciliation. And y'all, that's key in any kind of conflict. Is that we persistently pursue reconciliation with one another. Because y'all, we can get hurt. And we can, we can, be, we can be traumatized. And y'all, and those, real, those feelings are real. That trauma is real. That hurt is real. But we forgive and we pursue reconciliation. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 18 when Peter comes to him and says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, which is what their tradition was. And Jesus responded and says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven Jesus' response is, you just keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. (laughs) Y'all, it it hits me too. Okay. It hits me. Y'all, it's easy to get angry and stay angry. It's supernatural to not remain angry. We need a supernatural help from the Holy Spirit to do these things, to forgive 70 times 7. This doesn't happen without Christ, without the Holy Spirit. And as James writes in his letter, James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, he says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. There's nothing that we can accomplish in reconciliation with a relationship if we just stay angry. He says, be slow to anger. Y'all, obviously, uh, our number one context here was marriage. Y'all, that, man, just apply that across the board. James is actually talking about within the church, being slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So we persistently pursue reconciliation. Well, since Darling's heart has softened to Beloved, she is on a mission. And she has now gotten the daughters of Jerusalem to help her out. So they want to know how they can help. So in verse 9, they ask a question. What kind of Beloved is your Beloved, O most beautiful among women? It's a nice little compliment from the chorus. It's her dream, right? And so uh, I dream about people complimenting me all the time. All right. (laughs) What kind of beloved is your beloved that thus you adjure us? One, they're asking her, like, give us a description of this man. And also, why is he so important? Why do you want to see this man? And so they want to get the details. They want to help find her in this dream. And so she gives him, her, them, a very poetic description of her beloved. Y'all, I love this passage because now, I mean, the man has, beloved has has described darling in such beautiful poetic ways. Now it's his turn, all right? So, all right, this is great. Ladies, take notes. Okay, so she describes her beloved in this awe-inspiring, man, he is like a statue to be gazed upon, okay? I'm going to use my wife's joke. She called him a trophy husband. Okay, so this is what we see here. And so we begin in verse 10. My beloved is dazzling and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. Basically, he's rare. He's beautiful, like precious stones. He's one in 10,000. That's like the biggest number they knew back then. All right, today we would say one in a million His head, verse 11, his head is like gold, pure gold. His locks are clusters of dates and black as a raven. His head is precious. And I see here that it's a statue kind of of a gold. And so his head is chiseled and precious. His hair is thick, wavy, and black. Verse 12, his eyes are like doves. So now his eyes are doves too. Peaceful, handsome, and clear. I see the clear that they're beside streams of water, bathed in milk, and reposed in their setting. So she's looking, she's remembering his eyes and how beautiful they are just in the whites. His cheeks are a bed of balsam, banks of sweet-scented herbs. 
His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. Now she's moving down his face and she sees his chicks, his cheeks, and she sees them and, and they're, they're, she describes them as big mounds of herbs, okay? Like good smelling herbs, which is kind of a weird way. But basically it's to say that she enjoys smelling him, that he has a good scent to her. He's done the same thing for her. And then she goes to his lips and says, your lips are attractive, they're desirable, probably to kiss. That's what she's thinking here with the liquid myrrh. And then in verse 14, she turns and she goes to his hands and his arms. And his hands are rods of gold with, set with beryl. His abdomen is carved, carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. Basically, his arms and his hands are strong. His body is chiseled ivory like a statue. I, too, have abdomen carved in ivory. This is a bodysuit. Okay, so... <laughs> I just, I don't want to brag. All right. But y'all, if y'all can imagine, he's, he's Michelangelo's the David, which is ironically his father. If you've ever seen that statue, uh, I've actually seen it in person. It's, it's really cool. You go up and it's on this big pedestal. And of course, it's a feature piece there. And it is really the, what they would consider the perfect specimen of a man. And everything's perfect. And that's the way she's seeing him. She continues in verse 15 that his legs are pillars of alabaster set on pedestals of pure gold. His appearance is like the Lebanon choice as the cedars. Again, she is describing him as continued to be strong like a statue and the same valuable material, gold, from head to toe. And then she says that he is like the cedars of Lebanon. Lebanon was known for its forests and his valuable trees. So he has value. He has strength. And then she goes back to his mouth. She really likes kissing because she says his mouth is full of sweetness and he is wholly desirable. This is my beloved and he and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. She goes back to the mouth, these, these sweet kisses that she loves, and she talks about how desirable he is and that how she is close to him as a friend. She's, he's not just her beloved, not just the man she's in love with, but also just a close friend. Y'all, this description is, is poetic. It's majestic. You saw it. I mean, it's almost like the statues of, of idols that they would make in Babylon. And so she, she looks at this man. She's awe-inspired by him, the way he looks, and why she, he, just the stature that he has. Now, I'll also say, remember, they were trying to find out what he is like so they could find him. Her description is not very helpful, okay? <laughs> it is very poetic. But you can imagine they're sitting there going, okay, all right, kind of like the forensic th person, the police or whatever, detective. And all right, so uh, can you tell me what he looks like? All right, all right, yeah, head of gold, yeah, uh, ivory abs. Yeah, this is not going to be very helpful. She's very much in love. Uh, but... <laughs> You're going to have to help us out. Where is he? Okay, so that's basically what they do here is they just ask where he's gone. Okay, in this dream, in verse 1, we see that where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? And so she, they just ask, well, where has he gone? And all of a sudden, in the dream, of course, it's a dream, all of a sudden she knows, all right? <laughs> she's, like, she's like, oh yeah, he's right over here. Okay, so that's what she says in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 6. My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of balsam, to pasture his flock in the gardens and gather lilies. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He who pastures his flock among the lilies. So all of a sudden, darling knows exactly where he is. Now remember, these, all these uh, words, garden, lilies, um, pasturing his flock, these words kind of take on a little bit different nuanced meanings as we go through the book. Sometimes they're very specific for her body. Sometimes they're general about kind of her body and her sexuality. And then also there's even a further view of they're general about his care and still in that very intimate way of her, okay? 
I think on this particular case, I think it's, it's on that further view of now she's been asked, well, where is he? He's caring for me. Notice that she hasn't, I don't know if she's necessarily found him. Maybe she has. But one thing she does, she makes a very declarative statement and she remembers who this man is. And this is the man that has been caring for her, who's been cherishing her. And this anxiety dream seems to end to, in, no, in her knowing the truth of their relationship all along. Yeah, there's been conflict. Yeah, there's been trouble. But she remembers. This man does care for me. He, he cherishes me. He nourishes me like a shepherd in the pasture. And she remembers the care that she has for him and the care that he has for her. And she says, you know what? That's where he is. And notice what she says. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. Now, that knowledge is just not out of nowhere. She doesn't just make that declarative statement and say, you know what, it doesn't matter what he does as long as I know that that's the truth. No. She understands that there's, there's proof to their belonging to one another. There's evidence in their relationship. Y'all, external or internal circumstances, they can always affect our emotions. And that's what happens. We, we put up things as idols or we, we put things in, in, uh, in our particular space and we say, you know what, if that gets messed up, then I'm going to have an emotional response to it. And that's where conflict can happen. We can have expectations for our spouse. And when those expectations don't get met, met then we get all upset. We get all in conflict with one another. And then we're arguing over toothpaste and it has nothing to do with toothpaste. Our emotions can lead us also to make inaccurate conclusions of our relationship. Because we get lost in our heads. It happens. But then in the end, this woman, darling, she knows that she belongs to her beloved and her beloved, and her beloved belongs to her. And it's not, again, I, I, want to, I want to reiterate this, that it's not just because they know it and it's just this, this truth claim, but it's that she sees the evidence of him caring and cherishing for her and nourishing her. That's what we get in, in verses 2 and 3, where, where it says in chapter, two, in chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, that he's gone down to his garden, to the beds of balsam, to pasture his flock among, in the gardens and gather the lilies. There's evidence to his, to his intimacy with her. There's evidence to his care and his cherishing her. And she remembers that evidence. She remembers that, that cherishing that he has for her. And she says, I am his and he is mine. You know, I think it's important in our relationship to remember the commitments that we have with one another. Just to remember those commitments, but then also demonstrate those commitments with the cherishing and the nourishing and the admiration and the affection. We saw maybe a little bit of conflict, but then her heart opens up to him. And she pursues him. He's pursuing her with his hand. You know, they wanted to be with each other. And yeah, there was a bump in the road. But they just kept going. That's sometimes what we have to do. Sometimes there's a big bump. But this idea of us making a declaration of ownership or of care, really, and then having that demonstrated, y'all, it's, it's true in the Christian life. That we can, all day long, as Christians, make a declaration of love for Jesus Christ. But y'all, if it's not backed up by evidence, what assurance do we have? First John, the book of First John, the, the one that Malachi is going to be teaching in his Bible study, goes all through this evidence of our love for Christ. In fact, John... and. And just, just the demonstration that this evidence that we have for our love for him and in just 
our loving other Christians, our obeying Christ, our confession of sin, our declaration of belief that Jesus is the Son of God, all those things in our life, our obedience and our trust and our endurance in faith, all those things are evidence that demonstrate our love for Him. It's true in your marriage. I love you. Let me demonstrate that in our relationship. Jesus demonstrates His love for us in so many ways. And one passage that really shows this is John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. Read it with me. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf scratches, snatches them and scatters the flock. He flees because he is a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back. This commandment I received from my Father. Man, there's so much in that passage that I want to unpack for you. We don't have the time. But what I do want you to see is that Jesus, being the chief shepherd, he cares for his sheep. And he demonstrate, demonstrates that by laying his life down for us. He says, no, this other person, this hired hand, they're not going to do it. Not to, the, not to the level that I am. They might feed you. He might do something else. He might take you out and get some water. But he's not going to risk his life for you. But Jesus says, I will lay my life down. He is the only true shepherd who will take care of his sheep the way that they need to be taken care of. Demonstrate, he demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In Ephesians 5, and I bring this up a lot, husbands, their relationship, your relationship, relationship with us. Passages like this make that a very high bar. Now, I will say, lots of men will say, yes, I will lay my life down for my wife. I will die for her. That's kind of easy to say when you're living in a kind of a safe place, right? But will we demonstrate it in other ways? Will we demonstrate our love in a way that we will have mutual admiration and affection for one another? We will have a demonstration of love that is just vitally important in the midst of internal and external pressures? Will we keep pursuing reconciliation even though it's hard? Will we keep doing those things to demonstrate our love? Again, I'll say that we need to persistently pursue one another and show our love because Jesus did. He loves us so much and He was patient with us. In fact, in the passage that we just read, He says, there are some sheep that are still not part of this fold. He's waiting. He's patient. He's patient towards you, as Peter says. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He patiently waits for us. He pursues us because He loves us and He demonstrates it. How much more should we demonstrate our love and our patience and our love for our spouse? Let's follow Jesus' example in that. Let's pray. Father, you know that conflict comes. You know it better than anyone. Lord, you died on a cross in the midst of conflict. The hatred that the world showed to you because of who you were meant your death on a cross. 
But Lord, we thank you that in your death you took on the wrath that you did not deserve. You took our sin that we committed so that we could be forgiven. Father, thank you for continuing to extend your hand to us and not writing us off in our sin. Lord, to go out and continue to send your Son, Jesus, to this earth to become like a man, to suffer and die. Lord, I pray that we can take your, experience, your relationship with us and apply it in so many ways to our relationships with others and then also, importantly, to our spouse. Father, we love you. No, we're going to do this imperfectly. You know it. But I pray that we do it in obedience and trust in you. In your name I pray. Amen. Savior say, your strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me your all in all, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Lord now indeed I find your power and yours alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed in white as snow And when before the throne I stand in Him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed in white as snow. He washed in white as snow. He washed in white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, Life.
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He did pay our debt. He made us pure. We became the bride of Christ. And He cherished us. And He washed away every sin. And He took it on Himself. And this is what we remember every week with the Lord's Supper. We remember the sacrifice that He made for us. We remember that His body was broken for us. We remember His blood was spilled for us. And He did it all because He loved us. He showed mercy for us. Not because we deserved it. And it's so that every generation would know Jesus Christ. So if you have believed in Him, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, I invite you today, as we do every week, to take the bread and take the cup and eat and drink in remembrance of what He's done for us. If you have never believed in Jesus Christ, I invite you to take Him today, to believe in Him for the first time, to trust in Jesus Christ and have eternal life. So if you've believed in Him, I invite you now. We have tables on the wings. Take the bread and take the cup of juice. Bring it back to your seat and we will eat and drink together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and we had given thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we are proclaimers of the truth. That we tell people about the cherishing relationship that we can have with Jesus Christ. That we can have peace and hope and love that is eternal through you. Lord, I pray that we demonstrate that through our marriages, that we demonstrate that through our relationships, and we tell people this message of Jesus Christ, and we give people the hope that they so desire. In your name I pray, amen. It's really great seeing y'all. You are sent.